Right, next let's go to page 14 and look at what coaching is not. Coaching is actually used very, very widely. We use coaching in so many different places and niches, whether that be a manager who might be coaching a team member, whether it's sports coaching. Uh, very often I actually get psychologists, psychiatrists that come to the training to learn some coaching skills and some additional techniques that they can use. We might coach our children. In fact, we can coach in many different places in many different ways. But coaching is different to a number of the other methodologies that we use. And so coaches are trained in very specific and different skills and methodologies to example a counselor or a psychologist or a doctor, etc. So there are certain things and certain situations that I think we should not even attempt as a coach and refer that client out to a different support professional. Example, somebody who uses uh, drugs. This depends on your skill set. So example, let's say that you were somebody who was working with drug addiction and you then utilized coaching within your therapy then that would be okay. But for many coaches, working with drug addiction probably is not the right thing to do. Because you need to understand the impact of the drugs. You need to understand when that client needs to go to a rehab center, how to work through the rehab center, what type of uh, facilities they might need, what other help they might need. So drug abuse, uh, somebody who's suicidal, I would say immediately you should refer that person to a psychiatrist. Uh, domestic violence, bit of a gray area. You know, are you going to work with that client? What are you going to do? So if you know that there is a client who's being, uh, let's say there's a wife who's being beaten by her husband and you're coaching that client, what's very important to remember is we don't tell the client what to do. And so you might find yourself in a position where you want to say, oh, well, just leave him. Of course, that's not the coach's place. And so doing domestic violence could be a tricky one. You know, it might be better to actually refer that person out to somebody else who's more adequately trained to work with, uh, with somebody like that. Food misuse like bulimia and anorexia for most coaches probably wouldn't be right to take that client on. In fact, I'm going to add a caveat here. Whenever you work with clients, if they're currently working with a healthcare professional, uh, whether they're working with a doctor or psychiatrist or psychologist, or, I think it's important to get a referral. So that client has got to get a referral from that practitioner or that professional and give you that recommendation or that referral before you actually start working with them. You know, just to cover yourself. For most people, like I said, you know, dealing with bulimia and anorexia probably would not be within their scope of practice uh, and scope of expertise. So it might be better to refer that client out. Somebody who's a danger to themselves or danger to other people, again, probably should be referred out to a psychiatrist or a psychologist people with mental illness alcohol misuse on the other hand you know you might choose to work with somebody who's a uh, alcoholic but you might not again it depends on the situation depends on the severity uh, and depends on some of the other things that might be going on you know are they in a 12-step process uh, personally i don't believe in 12 in the 12-step process but you know, are they in a uh, in a rehabilitation program? What else is going on for them? So, for traditional coaching, you know, many of these things probably not not the type of clients to be working with. And so, without actually knowing that the person falls within any of these categories, you know, aside from that, you know, here's some of the things that you might want to look out for. So, somebody who's extremely emotional. You know, and it seems that that upset is highly disproportionate to their circumstances. Or somebody whose physical inability to remain present, you know, maybe their eyes are darting around all the time, or they're glazed, or they it might give you some indication that they're on drugs. Uh, somebody who shows signs of physical abuse to their bodies. Now, 
let's say that you were coaching a child who was being abused or a child who was being physically beaten by the parents you know where do you go from there who do you refer that child out to you know so we spoke about confidentiality uh, earlier and a very important aspect and thing to bear in mind with confidentiality is that what happens between the coach and the client is confidential yet it doesn't carry the same confidentiality as what you might expect between a doctor and their client or a solicitor and their client if I was working with a, a child that showed physical signs of abuse then you know possibly contacting somebody at child services uh, would be the best thing to do somebody maybe who has extreme lack of responsiveness and emotion or that has excessive aggression towards you or to you know somebody else somebody who fails to contribute to the sessions you know and do their tasks and now this doesn't fall quite in the same category as the other things we've spoken about but if somebody is not doing their tasks if they're not taking the actions and contributing to the sessions then you know they might just not be ready for coaching I think it's very useful that as a coach that you have a a list of contact details and numbers of people that you can refer to I mean on, on a totally separate path let's say you were coaching somebody and they were struggling with financial issues now unless you are a specifically a financial coach and you have financial background it might be better to send that client to speak to a financial advisor and you know there are certain industries that pay commissions and if you were going to get a commission so example sending somebody to financial advisor and the financial advisor was paying you a commission on business that was written I think it's important also to to be upfront with your client with things like that you know to tell your client look I'm not the right person for you I think you need to speak to the financial advisor uh, please bear in mind and, and know that you know if you do do any business with them then you know he might pay me a commission and just have cards on the table okay so let's just look at, at coaching compared to some other methodologies so, so the first is therapy and coaching definitely is not therapy you know therapy talks about a patient and something being wrong with the patient and often dealing with the past we're coaching we're really interested in moving forward and helping the client set goals in therapy often the therapist diagnoses the patient and seeks to heal a broken patient you know in coaching we believe that our clients aren't broken and they can create a better future for themselves now interestingly one of the additional certifications that we teach during the live training is timeline therapy uh, or hypnotherapy uh, mindfulness and some other modalities and although those things are not typically coaching I think there's a time and a place to do blended coaching so if I was working with a client who really really couldn't move forward because they were stuck with some issue in the past maybe they had a limiting belief or maybe they had a major traumatic experience in their past and they that was blocking them from moving forward and taking action then I could do some therapy to allow them to let go of that and then move forward within the coaching but actually highlighting that as such now that of course is only because I have those skills and so you've got additional skills within your quiver should I say and be free to use them just know that there is a difference between therapy and coaching and know when to label each and when to use each so that there's a clear understanding between the coach and the client is what's actually going on and what's being offered okay coaching also is not consulting so consultants are experts in their field and they sell this expert advice and consultants you know they might take credit for the work that's actually being done or the results that have been achieved and they maintain the expert position where in coaching the client is actually the one that's doing the work and the client is going to discover and utilize their most productive strategies and values and 
other modalities that are already at their disposable. You know, they might just not be utilizing them properly, or they might just not be in touch with how to, to move forward. And so in coaching, really, the focus is on the client and achieving their goals and their objectives. So whereas in consulting, the consultant is the expert, in coaching, really, the client is the expert. And it's helping them to get in touch with those, those resources. Of course, coaching also is not training. Very often when people do trainings, uh, certainly in, in business, People often do trainings and, you know, they go back to their, to their job and they have every intention of employing what they've learned. However, they find that maybe it's due to the demands of the organization or the job that they're in, that soon they fall back into the same way or the old way of doing things. And so training in itself sometimes can be a little bit lacking. Whereas if I use coaching with the training, the client has the training and then we coach them how they can actually implement that within their organization or within their business and their job and role. Trainers, you know, are usually experts in their fields and they teach the student what to do. They tell them what are the methods and what are the skills and, and specifically how to go about doing what they need to do. Whereas with a coach, on the other hand, we're there to assist the client to discover, you know, how they can change and take charge of their mental processes. Coaching and training are, are, are two totally different things. Of course, coaching also isn't mentoring, where mentoring focuses on providing advice, you know, almost like sage advice. You know, the mentor is somebody who's been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Mentors are often older and they have knowledge in that particular area that they're mentoring their mentee. Now, mentors have been known to help the mentee in improving as a person as well, if, of course, the mentee allows himself to be mentored in that way. Coaching, again, we don't offer any advice. So the coach works with the client so that the client can utilize their own capabilities and discover you know, their understandings, their skills, their abilities to create the outcome that they want to create. And, you know, let's let's just liken that again to sports coaching, to, to normal coaching as an example. As a sports coach, that coach will very often, let's say it was a golf coach, the coach will tell the client, this is how you must stand. This is how you must swing the club. You know, this is the angle that you need to hit the ball. Whereas as a coach, as the description we're talking about, I might say to my client, okay, have you ever hit the ball the way that you want to hit it? How do you stand when you do that? What do you say to yourself? And so actually helping the client. Now, there might be, look, if nobody's, if the person's never picked up a club in their life, then of course there's a time and a place. And I can certainly work with a sports coach as well. And so the golf coach would, would teach the client the basics of how you should stand, you know, hold the club the right way around so it's not back to front, etc. And then I can coach the client for them to discover their best abilities and their way to do it. And I think that's really useful because if I'm if the, the sports coach is saying this is the way to do it, well then I think that limits the client in the long run. You know, it limits the client in being able to develop a new way, a new way to stand, a new way to swing the club, etc. And then of course we've got uh, coaching versus psychotherapy. And for sure coaching is not psychotherapy. Psychotherapy is an interpersonal relational intervention used by a trained psychotherapist. And, you know, most coaches aren't psychologists or they're not psychiatrists. And where a psychotherapist might be spending a, a lot of time in working with the past and clearing up past issues. In coaching, again, we don't spend a lot of time in wallowing in the problem. It's about moving forward. That being said, there might be a time and a place where 
the client wants to let go of something that's holding them back in the past so that they can move forward. I'll add that, you know, working with a psychologist or psychiatrist, example PTSD, for some clients have taken a long time and, you know, might take six to 12 months. Whereas with some of the techniques that we use within NLP, we can help let go of something like a phobia or PTSD in very little time. In fact, I've worked with clients to get rid of PTSD as little as an hour, uh, some even less than that. Now, that's not to say that the psychologist, psychiatrist doesn't know what they're doing. It's just different skills, different techniques. And, you know, all processes and I think all methodologies do advance. And there are times where one methodology or, or one way of doing something can be improved upon by another which in this case is an example like i said using a fast phobia model to get rid of a phobia in 30 minutes as opposed to working with a client over a few sessions or a few months and then finally i just like to add this idea between directive versus non-directive coaching and so non-directive coaching is where the coach asks questions to allow the client to find their own solutions a non-directive coach is not going to offer advice and very rarely even give suggestions through skillful questioning they're going to help the client to see the situation from a different perspective help gain clarity uncover options challenge inconsistencies and, and generally hold the client accountable for their actions the added benefit, of course, is that the coach doesn't need to be an expert in the client's field that they might be dealing with. So non-directive coaching may take a little bit longer. However, it's more empowering for the client. Whereas a directive coach, on the other hand, is where the coach does offer advice and solutions and tell the client what to do to solve their problems. You know, very often people will ask and, and they would like to have the answer. You know, if I if I had a pound for every time somebody said, but you my coach and that's why I'm paying you, you need to tell me what to do. You know, it's very easy and it's nice. Oh, because we live in a fast food world, don't we? We want fast food, fast cars. We want everything now. And well, really in the long run, that again doesn't empower the client. Whereas when we help the client... So that they get to the answer, they get to the solution, then they actually own it. Because if you tell the person what to do, they don't own the solution. And very often what will happen is that they don't then go and implement that solution. Whereas if they say it, to them it's true and they will go and do it. There's a great book to read, Alan Pease questions are the answers and although it's a book that was originally written uh, and it very often gets used within multi-level marketing I think it's very useful in coaching as well is to learn the process of where we are asking the questions so that the client is coming up with the solutions as opposed to us telling them what they need to do neither of these are necessarily right or wrong it does depend on the situation where the client really doesn't know what to do then maybe a bit more directive coaching might be useful uh, you know th this might be the case being a manager in an organization but where the client is just unclear or undecided then I think a more non-directive coaching process might be more useful and so in this way the client is not influenced by the coach's prejudice or judgment or preferences and so forth so there might also be a, a need for a combination of directive and non-directive coaching in certain circumstances. So uh, that's what coaching is and what coaching is not. And I think it's important to bear those in mind, especially if you do use other methodologies and other techniques, uh, and certainly as we look at NLP as well, is to know where the coaching line starts and stops and where some of the other methodologies might start and stop and of course how they can interact and interrelate.